Today I am joined by the disarming Tyson Yunkaporta, an Indigenous Australian academic, member of the Appalach clan in far north Queensland, and author of the Worldview Reconfiguring book, Sand Talk, which served as the basis of our conversation. In the book, Tyson explores our global systems from an Aboriginal perspective and how this viewpoint could help us resolve some of the complex sustainability issues facing our world today. In our conversation, we cover the Indigenous notion of story and the problem with the narrative at the heart of Western civilization, the value in true diversity, identity and place, violence and the need for its integration in society, why instead of pursuing growth we should seek increase, and most importantly, we speak of the need for humanity to retake our place as custodians of the land we are connected to. I think the work that Tyson is doing, bringing attention to indigenous knowledge and wisdom that has existed long before what we generally think of as civilization, is absurdly important given the global crises we face today. We are starting to see science catch up to what indigenous peoples have known for thousands and thousands of years. One perspective in particular that these traditions share that I feel is critical for us to adopt if we are to truly deal with our rapidly changing climate and the destruction of the biosphere is the perspective of being inextricably connected with the natural world. In the words of Chief Seattle, a Native American Indian chief who the city of Seattle was named after, This we know. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man did not weave the web of life, he is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Before we get into it, I am Sam Barton, and this is the Talk of Today podcast, where we explore developments in the world and what they could mean for the future with some of the world's leading scientists, philosophers, artists, innovators, and just generally awesome people who defy labels. For more of these explorations, subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast player, Connect with me on Twitter, and if you enjoy the podcast, share it with your friends and rate it on Apple Podcasts. I have committed to never running an ad during the podcast, so if you get some value out of the conversation, please consider contributing to my coffee fund uh, through the support link in the description below. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Dr. Tyson Yunkaporta. Uh, something really shifted in my mind and everything made a lot more sense mm. and what I think is kind of um, hilarious and it's poetic and it's beautiful it's that we are only now developing the science like when I say we I mean the west you know the enlightened the enlightened ones I said that sarcastically uh, we are only now developing the words and the frameworks and the, the concepts through perhaps complexity science that actually makes indigenous wisdom um, comprehensible because mm. it's too far advanced in a way for us historically to have been able to kind of conceive of it or integrate but now um that this the language of complexity is there in the west we can now kind of interface with this um with this knowledge uh, yeah more deeply wow um yeah i was just i was just writing something and it's kind of manifesto like probably nobody will ever read it outside of my lab we're just trying to figure out our theory of knowledge theory of change hmm. you know um <clears throat> well, something that so it, uh, i don't know it's just uh, uh so you know I'm, I'm sort of asking the question of what does a governance structure look like in an indigenous think tank with a systems and complexity focus mm -hmm. you know um especially when we seek to ground this in right way, law and law, L-A-W and L-O-R-E, at a time when our families and communities have never been more at odds around what any of that means. Um, can I read you this couple of paragraphs? Yeah, yeah, I'd love that. Just in my talk to that, and it might make a sound bite, I don't know. Holistic, sustainable, regenerative, relational. These are brands associated with our indigenized group identities. Systems and complexity, these are new names for old patterns and processes we know well, but have been steered away from in the academy and activism for quite a few decades now. Systems analysis and change mean structural awareness and action, but the marginal have been directed away from structures and towards post-structuralism and discourse analysis. The post-everything mole 
where we have shopped to outfit Indigenous standpoint theory and Indigenous methodologies, offers a limited and limiting data set that is important, but not enough for triangulation let alone the polyangulation that's always been central to Indigenous methods of inquiry. Women, Indigenous, queer, all of us at the margins, we've been directed towards critique and post-colonialism, centred our voices occasionally, but lost sight of the structures of limitless growth and extraction that drive our ongoing genocide. Meanwhile, complexity science and systems thinking as disciplines have been founded and occupied by mostly older European males. They formulate and compute the alchemy of emergence to harness biopower for transhumanist civilization projects. And we are arriving late to a party in a house we were evicted from long ago. Something is missing in their emergence algorithms. And we're welcomed to the party because some of them suspect that we may carry the philosopher's stone the ancient X factor missing from their alchemical regeneration devices. The rest welcome us because we make Enlightenment 2.0 look inclusive. And so we bring the sexy illusion of ancient wisdom and the missing link of paleoontology. But we know what we're doing is not emergence, but remergence. We know the difference between spirit and illusion, knowledge and data, land and real estate, insight and hot takes. We all hold a living memory of what it is to govern collectively in right relation. It's just been a while since we saw that operating in fields uncontaminated with self-interest. Um, anyway, it goes on, but you get the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, really it's, I, I just found it hard to answer that when I had that writing so fresh in my head. <laughs> of course, yeah, I think that was, that was perfect. That was a better answer than I could have hoped for. So it's that moment that that thing you said about the philosopher's stone that aspect that is perhaps missing perhaps the the life that's kind of missing the liveliness the the earth the the messiness that's kind of missing from these approaches of these disciplines the way these are spoken about i think based on what i've read in your book and whatever elsewhere and, and just listening to you speak i feel like that really might be the case mm. um that the, that the the truth to and the word truth i think is the right one because mm. it is truth like it's a it's a embodied knowledge mm. um it's it's not just embodied in us but like the, the way I, he, I i heard you speaking about truth in the landscape truth in the relations truth in being mm. i think really really resonated and it kind of kind of it broke down some things in my brain and I've got, um, it's like there was a windowsill that was blocking my viewpoint and that window, the window has just kind of been smashed, but now I've got like this whole huge vista that I can now, uh, that I can now see <laughs> something framed by the small, from, from by the small little, uh, frame. Just watch um, the broken like, glass. Yeah. yeah. It's sharp. Yeah. 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 So something that, one of the things that really struck me was this word story and I didn't mm. get it for a long time. And I realized that story or what, what, what we're kind of talking about here is like this, um, it's all about knowledge and mm. it's not knowledge in the <clears throat> conventional, in the way that I guess most of us think of it as knowledge in books, but it's knowledge that is lived. It's embodied. It's constantly being created and transmitted and changing but in a way that's firmly rooted. It's not that it has foundations, but its root is in the network, right? It's yeah. Like the, the network can catch it's you. There context, is no context yeah. dependent. Yeah. So that's yeah. the land. Yeah. Was, yeah, so but also yeah, what is, a story? Yeah, so is a story and, and well. will, and is, and will be, you know? Yeah. So it is context dependent. So that includes everything that's happening now, mm. you know, everything in creation, every, everything as dreaming or I can't re re exist. Everything's mm. in relation. To everything else whether it's good relation or bad relation a lot of bad relation going on but it still is you know and that's that's part of what is and you know um you know real so indigenous knowledge systems like you know as systems as uh not just lived knowledge but living knowledge you know of not just what was but what is and will be that is intensely context dependent you know um 
and I think uh, those of us who engage with it like that sort of publicly a little bit, um, you know, there's a kind of sexiness to that because there's that kind of, ooh, juxtaposition, old, old ways and new ways together, you know. I, I don't know how long <laughs> sort of that goes on before people stop finding it sexy and new and interesting. But anyway, um, yeah, so there's interest that way. But there's... Um, you know, there's, I mean, pretty much every discipline that we have, you know, coming out of the Enlightenment and then, you know, um, through the sort of only century old system of nations globally and liberalism and, um, you know, everything else, the big project of uh, universalizing and universitizing knowledge, you know, out of all that, you know, um, things... <laughs> Things have really changed, but all those disciplines are really grounded firmly in, in this sort of wrong story. Uh, everything starts with when we were cavemen. You know, all of the yeah. disciplines always have a when we were cavemen sort of uh, foundation. And that's uh, usually really wrong, no good baseline data uh, about assumptions. With people projecting back into a past and go, well, what would, what would happen to me? What would I do if I was dropped like bare grills in the shit? <laughs> Like, you know, with, with no phone and no clothes and, and, you know, if we were all dropped back there, what would happen, you know? And then I guess they just kind of model from that. And it's like, well, I would probably start raping and killing people because there's no rule of law. You know, I would probably, you know, um, oh, what, what, how was that language formed? I probably bumped my head on the roof of the cave and said, ow. And then after a while, ow came to mean the roof of the cave or, look out, you know, and it's just like, oh, man, there's a, a lot of really non-scientific, it's not even a Bayesian an analysis that's forming sort of this narrative of history that's just, um, I mean, it's completely incorrect <laughs> mm. and wrong. But look what you're talking about before, that philosopher's stone. It's that, so, so A, there's that attraction of the kind of paleo thing, like we want to be able to... Um, map uh, like we need to be able to cherry pick from this paleontology to sort of uh to back this sort of progress narrative leading up to the enlightenment and then see what supports that you know everybody's looking so i mean i have um you know pro-life people contacting me and and looking to cherry pick little bits and pieces of you know paleo cultures uh to support their arguments that you know yeah that it's natural to, you know, and that's always been thus that, you know, you, you know, that, that, um, you know, life is sacred from the moment of conception and, you know, never, ever, ever. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're usually not very, I mean, nobody's very happy when I talk about, um, uh, you know, um, you know, what I know, which is limited as a male because that's women's business, but what I know of contraception methods that go back to the dawn of time and um, not just contraception, but also, um, you know, um, you know, getting rid of a, a baby that's not viable um, for whatever reason. I mean, there are, you know, um, many, many bush medicines in every region of Australia that um, women have always used to, to take care of that, to regulate their fertility. And, you know, it's pretty much always been done everywhere. <laughs> so it's never a satisfying answer. And we'll get back to the philosopher's stone in a sec. I just feel like I've been talking for too long. Yeah, um, no, that's, 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 that's great. Um, I'm happy to just listen, to be honest. Um, I, I do want to come back to this, like, what is, what is a story? In, like, when you use the word story, how do you mm. think of it? We kind of touched on it, but to me, it's got a lot more depth than perhaps, I mean, I tried mm. to, I didn't even give it justice to it, but I think there's a lot of depth there. And, you know, you speak of, you know, song lines and, sto you know, there's stories, song lines, and I feel like I don't quite understand what's being, yeah, what's being referenced there. And I guess when it comes to stories, in particular, and I see it as like stories, but in the context of place. Like something that really clicked with me was, um, if knowledge, and I know I'm probably going to like say some stuff that you're about to say, but I think it might help with the context of the of the conversation. Mm if knowledge is kind of embedded in the landscape you know it, you're mm. in um your your understanding of the world is not contained within you but it's extended in the in in, in place um it kind of made a lot more sense to me why 
the destruction of um, so in Australia we've got mining companies we've got loggers we've got dodgy mm. shit going on you mm. know, um, important uh, Aboriginal people's sites are being destroyed right and mm. to me I used to think of that as like a sacred places a sacred places being destroyed but having read some of your work I don't see it as that anymore I see it as mm. a library being burned mm. would you say that the kind of that kind of fits does that kind of make sense yeah yeah because it's different i mean so you say the story or our story but we don't have those articles like that in, in that language mm. it's just story and story basically is a psychotechnology um uh, that allows anybody to inhabit an entire ontology uh, not just human but non-human uh, so if all your knowledge is embodied in that way it's not inside you but it's external and in your relations in your relationships your pairings with every human being in your network but also every non-human being in your network and that's where your knowledge sits you know um story is your way of navigating that field um it's a psychotechnology for navigating that in a way that you can share an ontology with somebody mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily i know we're called an oral culture because that's part of that paleo mythology of the <laughs> brutal <laughs> brutish and primitive past you know um yeah but uh, that's not really how <laughs> that's not really how it goes it's not just i mean we're not a print-based culture in terms of um you know having symbols for different speech sounds you know but um the way i mean the story just is it's in the landscape in landforms you know along all these different uh, paths of, for navigating the landscape you know story is that map of the landscape the the land itself and but also your inner maps of that that sit in your relationships not really inner so much as embodied maps you know um <clears throat> it's 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 in movement and yes it's in words but also song and um all kinds of things so what's that um uh, sonia didgeridoo there from um the Hagen family you're connected to in South Australia. What's uh, what's the image what on that? Uh, uh, fish. Fish. What do we got there? Ah, uh, so is that an eel-tailed catfish? Um, I. It, it looks, looks like a. I'm actually not too sure. But so it looks like what I call picochi. You know, and so you, you look there and that's that's story. And, you know, it's not just some dots and some lines around that. That's uh, these are all there's story in there. There's information and it's all sort of like a mnemonic device. But, you know, also, you know, spiritually, it conveys knowledge. So there's uh, seasonal knowledge there. You know, there's also a uh, place in there like these uh, those increased sites like for that for that animal so if you're totemically connected to that one um you know through your great grandfather and you know if it's in uh queensland and so if you're that uh father's nephew there if i uh, you had that if his great grandfather is your grandfather or, or whatever that one line down then you're that nephew mm. you know then maybe and you've been given that one then you have a connection to that place and a responsibility for that one and you understand that when you see the you know that silky oak tree there flowering that that one is fat that's that fat time for that one it's this uh picochi this um freshwater you know um uh, freshwater eel tail catfish you know um and there are a whole heap of other things associated with that and and different seasonal things that go on it's connected then to yabbies and then the ants on the riverbank and what they do in in different seasons and the scent signals and how they trigger massive reactions throughout that system and your way of navigating that is is through story story allows you to inhabit the ontology of that catfish mm. um not just you know and but you know it's kind of and it's not anthro anthropomorphic or anything um you know, but there is a, a kind of a, a human feeling of that story from a time when we're all related, you know, to so that you understand that you're in relation there. So you you inhabit that entire ontology within that system. And, and you know, so catfish story is about is about. Uh, uh, so, you, you know, right now, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, you're obviously adjacent with the sense making crowd and 
and, and, yeah. and all those yeah. ones. Um, so, you know, that, that sort of stoic idea of inhabiting another person's position, yeah. like you steel man their position, mm-hmm. you know, um, what if you didn't inhabit their position on an issue, but you inhabited their entire ontology? What does that mean then for knowledge transmission? What's the pedagogy that's implied there? How, how do you learn something? You know, you inhabit the entire ontology of your teacher and you are watching that person uh, doing something so that then the first time you ever attempt it, it's with complete mastery. So there's uh, every everything comes through story in that way and even down to the way you your observation is complete is that deep listening uh, way of observation with not just all the senses, but your being sort of, there's a fluid self other boundary. It's not like me and you, it's you, me is, Mm -hmm. is one thing. And you're in that kinship pair of relatedness in that time. And and you, you receive all that knowledge that way. Mm. Um, And there's no, it's, there's no, there's like a, a small, there's a distinction between, there's, I wouldn't say it's a very weak distinction, but there's, there's me, there's you, there's us, there's the land and all of them exist in relation to one another. So yeah. there's no, there's no separation. And this, I think one of the, the West, right, is built upon, it's Christian, right? It's, it's built upon the, the transcendent man, this idea that man has somehow risen above nature and it has this power kind of speaks to this narcissism that you that you speak of quite a lot in in sand talk i mm. see them as as the one and the same that because we have ascended to some degree we have this capability we have this concept we have the power to manipulate the world around us mm. we think that grants us the right to lay claim to lands to lay claim mm. to you know treat the natural world as as however however we wish and we that's how we act and live today right like yeah nothing's changed for two thousand years you know, Eve took, she bit the apple, nature's bad. We should just do whatever we want to, mm. to nature because we have this divine right. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, a, a lot of that is a, is a kind of a, a story that's, that's begun at a certain point uh, in order to sort of claim that, that way of being, um, you know, for one group of people um, or to critique that way of being, you know, as being uh, intrinsic to one group of people. That's quite evil, but a lot of it, um, you know, so there's a longer legacy of that. So in the particular brand of weird Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, uh, did arise from, um, some pretty, uh, some pretty horrendous tinkering that was done with, uh, family structures and family law and marriage law, uh, by the Catholic church, um, back in the day. So a, a lot of that individuation, you know, was really reinforced through there and, um, uh, it was. It became structural within an economic system, in order to be able to extract. Well, you couldn't extract. You can't extract wealth from a family where property is communal and it's owned by an extended family. You can't. Um, you can't radicalize one person into you know signing over all their wealth to you so that they get to go to heaven. <laughs> you know. He, yeah. he, it's very difficult to do that. Um, and you're he, referencing the um, banning, like not not being allowed to marry your first cousin. Right. It wasn't just first cousins. It went right up to like sixth, seventh, eighth cousins. It went right up to if if your brother married someone from this family, then that whole family was in laws and they were out, off off. They were out oh, of bounds really? to you as well. Um, but it got very, very. That they just kept doing it to the point where it was almost impossible to get married because then people would buy indulgences as well yeah. if they could afford that. But first, you had to yeah. Um, so people had to individuate wealth, and and that sort of opened the door down the track later uh for the mortgage trick on land that they invented to um to get uh native lands back from um the indians in the the (laughs) in the new world you know um that was invented as a trick like land as capital was invented just as a trick to get indian land back um but it worked so well that that ended up spreading and that just sat perfectly within the structures that church created but you know the whole uh individualism and separation from nature it started before that and you could go back to ancient greece and then claim that as western as well which i don't know how you would because that would be unrecognizable to the western mind 
today, what ancient Greece was like. Um, it was so much more Eastern than <laughs> anybody would tolerate now. But even oh, that, so like even that, the ancient Greeks, right? oh, oh, let's get into battle formations. I'm, I'm going to nerd out on that. But, um, but they inherited, you know, they all inherited all that from North Africa, West Africa, and the Fertile Crescent as well, you know, and they were experimenting with that beforehand. And, um, you know, everyone's pretty much experimented. Everybody experiments in their youth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody experiments and, you know, either they just, they don't inhale and they move on or they, you know, they go through that and then they're in recovery for a few millennia, you know, so that's why you've got all those ruins in Zimbabwe. You've got ruins everywhere. Like, you know, <laughs> in the Amazon, you've got them all over India, you've got them all over the place, these civilizations that people just went, yeah, no, nah, okay. I mean, and all the stuff in the Fertile Crescent that's not really very fertile anymore. Um, you know, there, there's a reason all the world's, some of the world's earlier civilizations are in the desert now because that wasn't desert before when they built them, but that's what civilizations do. Um, so people learn their lesson and then they return to um, pastoralism and, you know, moving with the land and, and et cetera, and they, they slowly start to rebuild their their ecosystems and ways of life right up until... And British Petroleum arrives and uh, <laughs> drags everybody kicking and screaming back into it, you know. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, that's how it goes. So this idea of Western, it, it's not really, you know, everybody experiments with civilization. We've got um, in Victoria where I'm living now and down in the bottom of Australia, you know, there are places where there's um, uh, systems of like aquaculture for eel, which is an interesting story there with that eel tail catfish there. Um, they have the same kind of seasonal you know, cycles anyway, and they're connected in that way. They're related. But that uh, there, there were uh, aquaculture systems, you know, lined with stain, stone masonry and, you know, um, you know, eel smoking sort of apparatus set up all over the place and permanent stone buildings, mm. you know, in permanent settlements. You know, that's been experimented with down here. And, you know, and you're talking about like... It finished. Well, yeah, so everybody's well done back, it. Right? Yeah, exactly. And then even yeah, yeah. further back, you know, it's it's everybody's story. This Tower of Babel, you can go with that. You know, in the book I mentioned the Barkindji story of like, I mean, I'm talking tens and tens of millennia back, you know, um, all, that was a lot of different language groups that all settled in one abundant place and had a permanent sedentary sort of, um, you know, settlement. And they, and they all started speaking the same language, same culture, established hierarchies, all the rest. And then a big freaking meteor came out of the sky and bloody blew the place to smithereens, you know. Um, and the, that, that story, which is Goanna's story, is all about, is all about um, you know, you have to maintain diversity. So all the Goannas were burnt with different, um, different markings on their bodies to remind us every time we see a Goanna and then the next one with completely different markings. It's like maintain your diversity. Mm speak different languages, spread out a bit, <laughs> make sure yeah, you yeah. spread out, you know, do not like gather together and try. I mean, you know, there's a mate, there's so much amazing stuff that you can do. Anything you can imagine, you can create when you bring everybody together and everybody's in service to this, this one singular machine with one dude at the top. Um, yeah. But, you know, it always ends badly. Always, every culture in the world has Tower of Babel stories, and you know, yeah, yeah. And what like diversity means something like, in this context, something to, different to what it kind of means in like general pop culture, right? It's not just like looking different, but it's um, thinking differently. It's the it's diversity in all its forms, right? Mm -hmm. so we want diversity of thought. We want diversity of of language, of ways of engaging with the world. Just for one reason is like we'll just come up with better solutions that way, right? Like if you if you're all thinking the same yep. way, you come up you all come up with the that's it the same solutions. Well, we've got a, a very I mean and and that that would be very unhealthy for uh, that sort of current tinkered globalizing system that sort of you know has kind of reached a singularity and is now self organizing. You know, it, it's very good at dealing with. Um, pathologies like you know actual diversity <laughs> happening mm -hmm. groups of people coming together who are all di divergent different thinkers and just amazing startling organic emergence 
just occurring in, in those things. It, this system is yeah. very good at dealing with that. So it's basically, and, and one way it, it does it is the same way your immune system, you know, um, responds, you know, to a pathogen. You know, it kind of replicates similar stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, if you get that vaccine and, and, you know, so your cells start going, oh, we're producing this spike protein and <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. oh, now we know what that is. It's the same way with the system of the immune system of this uh, global economy. Um, so, you know, you get a concert, you get something like diversity, true diversity, which is the threat to that. And so it just, uh, it takes it on board. It take it puts the name on the top of its you know mission statement, and it just rebrands what diversity is. It um, and it, it convinces us that we all belong to these group identities that are about our demographics. Yeah. You know our demographic information. So you belong yeah. to this group based on your gender, or you belong to this group, you know, um, based on your sexuality, uh, your skin tone, your ethnicity. You know, by nationality, not by actual your village ethnicity yeah. of the actual people you come from and the actual language you speak, but just your nation, Pakistan, or you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so we have these, you know, or you're in another group, uh, broad category, people of color, and then people of what? No color, punks. <laughs> I don't know how that works. Um, you know, so that would mean, you know, my two children who are, you know, 100% blood siblings you know but with completely different skin tones they they'd be divided they'd be put into two different group categories it's like no you, you belong to us <laughs> yeah. you belong to this family to this community to this clan but no we don't have that we've got group identities you know um she'll be a, a female poc and in that category and he'll be a, a male you know non-poc over there and that's what that will be for them you know, and it's, yeah. very, it's, 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 so they, they get it and they, and they, so they repackage and they make sure that the, you know, and then they can make sure that the, the board members or whatever, or people in a meeting, you know, that one of them has a turban and one of them's, you know, uh, female and another one's this one and that one. And there we have diversity, but they all went to the same universities, same, all to the same school, all did the same. They course. all did the same. <laughs> yeah. You know. MBA, all the projects, you know. they all have MBAs. They all, you, you know what I mean. And so, you know, you have stuff. Then, you know, you, you, I don't know, you're putting together your your team for facial recognition software, and and um, everyone on that team is, um, everyone on that team is literate for a start. You know, so um, you know that may, if they're literate, that means there is some stuff that that their, their brain has been biologically. Uh, rewired it's it's complete it's biologically different the act of being literate is biologically different to the point that um you know your left brain right brain connection is increased and your facial recognition software in your in your brain has to be migrated and placed in a different a different area on the other side and the other hemisphere of your brain and it doesn't work very well there so you've got your whole facial recognition team um who have you know biologically really shitty facial recognition skills and they're working on the coding for that <laughs> you know but if you get like i don't know you get a, a fella from a you know a, a, i don't know a refugee from a coastal village you know, east coast of africa or something you know you get him and they're on that team and there'll be some very different stuff going on he's gonna see some very different things and have some different ideas that would be diversity not because he's from africa but because he's not literate. You could get a fellow from down the road who hasn't learned to read and he would be a help. But the reason I mentioned coastal uh, and, and black is because that would also help. I mean, and the only way that's relevant, it's not relevant, you know, for the poster to look diverse, but if you've got a dark skin, dark skin person who lives on the coast, then they understand that um, stingrays don't sting black people. Uh, not stingrays, um, jellyfish. Jellyfish don't sting black people. Um, now, really? why is that? Because jellyfish can see black people. But jellyfish can't see light-coloured things. They just can't see it. So you might look at that and think, ooh, okay, could we do some biomimicry with looking at the um, 
you know, the, the, the vision of, of, of jellyfish. Uh, can we look at the light sensors of that? Because maybe there's a mechanism in there that we could include here so that the, so that our, um, hardware is actually able to, um, uh, to pick up light refraction off of dark surfaces. <laughs> Because currently it's not about a lack of diversity on the team and, you know, that it's their racism is somehow transmogrified into the code. Um, I can't see any evidence of that. There is no evidence of that, although that's the explanation. There is evidence, however, that the sensors that they're using are, um, they, they just don't work very well on, on picking up light off black surfaces because it's not very freaking reflective. So, <laughs> you know, so that illiterate fellow who happens to be black and happens to be from a coastal village he would he would understand that we probably need to look at the jellyfish he would also you know um have fully functioning uh, facial recognition himself and so would have something to contribute uh that would be diversity <laughs> you know um yeah oh and it would look good on the poster okay. hey look who we've hired it's um sahul from thing <laughs> yeah wearing his traditional garb I had I, I was going to talk about identity and this f how identity uh, so I think a lot of people are rootless today mm. and I'm like especially rootless I grew up in Asia for 19 years right so I didn't live in Australia I've spent most of my life in a and not even embedded in the culture there I, I went to an international school I was yeah. kind of like dipping my toes into different cultures. So I've never, and I came back to Australia and like, I'm not Australian mm. because I didn't grow up here, but I am. So I've kind of felt this, um, this breeziness, this driftiness mm. and it's great, but I've never had roots. And I, my girlfriend, she is, she's born in Spain, born and raised in Spain. And you know, the Spanish love life. They're all about family, yeah. you know, cousins living up and down, uh, up the road her uncle lived next door um she knows everything she knows her city backwards she just misses walking around the streets and like feeling her place right and she's got such a deep such a deep attachment to that place and mm. i that concept is completely foreign to me and i don't think mm. that's just the case for me i think it's actually the case for people who haven't even maybe left home mm. like, they might not have left their city but they live in these digital worlds they live kind of abstract lives if that makes sense yeah yeah so how do you how is identity because i know you write about identity and like this connection to people to place um how is that how is identity kind of solidified or formed and and supported in in um well I guess, it's it's about cultures? um yeah it's 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 about for humans not just indigenous people but all humans are patterned the same way up until about 100 years ago we all were yeah. Uh, quite profoundly yeah. embedded in place in our bioregion and that bioregion the entities and spirit of that land shape landscape shaped everything about you your accent your language your your custom your you know everything you know um i think it's only with that system and i'll work my way up to the macro and then back if you like yeah, um, yeah but you know the um so basically there was that system of nations that was experimented with over the last century and that's paled quite dramatically and at the same time then the kind of internationalism um you know there's another experiment with you know trying to make that work trying to make some community out of these massive collectives of monocultures that do not work either <laughs> those so those national identities all coming together and um you know, they're not working either because of, you know, uh, the game theoretical aspects of, you know, geopolitics, <laughs> etc., and they're just the absolute plunderings of the commons that is the Southern Hemisphere. The, um, you know, the plundering of that commons and the, you know, the race to the bottom there is, um, you know, that, that makes things, uh, it's made things a bit tense. A couple of world wars, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, we come to the 90s and, you know, um, your parents were all, out there trying to keep those structures in place so there, there are a lot of you global citizen international school babies yeah uh, coming out of the 90s in um in the space i've noticed yeah um, and I, I it transhumanism sense making game b uh intellectual dark web the entire constellation of um yeah. 
you know, thought worlds that are existing together there. There are a lot of, I keep running into, <laughs> you know, um, you know, these global citizen babies whose parents in the nineties were either diplomats or, um, or, you know, corporate hitmen, you know, yep. who had to yep. be out in these places. Um, petroleum. Yeah. Petroleum ensuring that the, yep. the, the extraction w was, was happening. And, um, I guess you so your parents were on the corporate side. Or the uh, diplomat side, actually, journalist actually. Like journalist, so okay. Like not, All right, but <clears throat> didn't fit. The, didn't fit the mold though. Like yeah. most of my the guys I went to school with, their parents were in that. You know, diplomats or they were yeah. brought in. It's like a lot of petroleum people. A lot of you know, it's like ha these countries well, that are developing don't have the expertise to dig it up. So they they yeah. pipe it in from elsewhere and then they pull out the resources and then ship it off. Well, it was, it's uh, that the, all of those people sent overseas, that was part of, I mean, the, they don't get sent for nothing. You know, that, that was part of the, um, the same project. So, so, you, you know, yours were in the propaganda wing, your parents. Yes. Uh, of, 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, you know, and sport for nation building is huge, oh, really huge. important. And in its nationalism, it's also really important, you know, yeah. uh, but, you know, um, yeah, it's a sport. <laughs> I mean, you, you just don't check me out. Check out Chomsky on that. But um, like I just referenced, I just say read Chomsky or like uh, Google <laughs> him on sport, you know, with that and um, and what the purpose of, of, of that is. I mean, it's it's come a long way, I guess, from the bread and circuses of Rome, you know, but uh, it still serves pretty much the same function, um, you know. So um, I, I'm not too familiar with it. Is it like entertainment and solidifying of a, a national ident identity? Is that kind of well, like it's part of I mean, it goes hand in hand with police. So basically, you know, violence is something that's supposed to be done by the state and is the exclusive domain of the state, except human beings have violence in their patterning. You know, it's part of our um, it's part of our patterning as an agent, yeah. you know, a, as an organism that is has agency in the world is that we we do violence and have do violence done to us. And we have, we're supposed to have all of those affordances as, as an, as an animal, as a being, we, we're supposed to have that in us and have full expression of that. And so that necessarily needs to be expressed. So a start for a start, we, that needs some kind of a vicarious expression. Um, so, you know, so spectator sports, mass spectator sports is that, but it also serves a purpose of nation building in terms of uh, training people for jingoism to be able to have an irrational, um, a rational s sense of loyalty to some arbitrary group, like a team, <laughs> like I'm barracking for that. And I'm going to be really upset if they lose. And I'm going to be, so it, you know, it trains you for the, the structures of, you know, um, representative democracy, all kinds of things. It also, you know, trains you to just be part of a, a mob with one voice, one language, mm. um, one goal, um, you know, where you don't see all the parts of the system that you're looking at but you are intensely focused on one part and the data and stats from that, like, you know, all the scores and all that sort of thing, <laughs> you know, even in ancient Rome, it's like, you know, oh, he's had 47 kills and bloody, you know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it's the, it's the same thing. So, you know, you, you're doing data, <laughs> but you know, with a very narrow focus, it, it, so it, it trains you for that to not be able to see the entire thing and question it. Also, you don't want to question it. You passionately support your side, your it becomes city, a part of your identity, doesn't it? Your state, your nation. Yeah, is that you passionately uh, support them, and you'll die for that. You know, you'll um, you know, uh, football hooliganism in the UK didn't come out of nowhere. That's just uh, you know, how that gets expressed naturally. Yeah. But the Brits are like, I mean, you can you can't put the Brits down. They'll be tribal forever there's been i mean no amount of you know great britaining of you know you trying to unite like you know break things into four discrete nations and then try and <laughs> try and unite them into one yeah. has not stopped that uh, regionalism and the bioregionalism that that shapes the hundreds of different accents how many accents are there on that tiny island it's and they won't they won't give them up and they're different they're like from they're like they're, they're talking and they're two people talking. It's like they're from different hemispheres, completely different. So that, that it's so powerful that I think it's a lot of it's to do with the groundwater. Those are uh, right. really sacred springs under the ground there. I think that you just can't stop that. And you can frack as many of those as you like, but you know, <laughs> that's, there's really powerful 
sacred sites bioregionally that I think it, it still works on people to make that unique patterning and that unique culture emerge in those places no matter what's done to them. And um, yeah, intensely tribal. So <laughs> it kind of backfired on them a bit and you ended up with uh, football hooliganism, but they managed to get on top of that uh, through various um, mechanisms, uh, trial and error. Yeah. Mm. I want to say on this topic of like violence, I guess, and tribalism, because mm. like as a man, I know there's, there's um, a lot of satisfaction in physical aggression and and violence in a sense, right? Like mm. I did um, a bit of boxing once and one of the most satisfying feelings I've ever experienced in my life was feeling my knuckles connect on some guy's face through the, through the yeah. glove. Right. And that's yeah. not a, that's not a, a peace loving, yeah. uh, you know, save the world type of and, feeling. But even right? more satisfying, someone else punching you in the face. What's that all about? It's, it's like, How take it. fucking take great it. do you feel after? Like, you know, oh, that's where my edges are. I'm doing something I'm supposed to be doing. You know, I'm still here. All right. Yeah. Okay. So death isn't this thing to be afraid of. All right. That's cool. <laughs> well, it's I'm not that special. I'm not entitled to have this like perfect, sanitary, peaceful existence because such a thing is horrendously unnatural and probably means I'm outsourcing my violence and entropy to somewhere else with horrendous consequences. This needs to be distributed throughout a system. Mm. I'm behaving as a node in a system must behave. You know, I'm doing all kinds of, all the different kinds of interactions and communications that I'm supposed to do. And one of those is violence. And preferably, yeah, but it's the goal, the aim of ritualized violence in the human species and part of our patterning is to increase relatedness. Mm. Weirdly, you know, violence is not to vanquish somebody and take their shit. That's not what it's for. It's because otherwise it's just everybody's going to always be picking up a bigger stick. It's not for that. It has, it's rule governed. It's ritualized. It's supposed to satisfy you. It's supposed to make sure that everybody feels agency and that they have expressed and asserted their boundaries, you know, um, at the same time as actually bringing them closer together, you know, and that's, uh, I guess, in this region where I'm living now, you know, um, you know, there's old um, archival reports um, of after, you know, tribal warfare, you know, there was a... Um, a protocol here of if you if you injured somebody, you were then responsible for their care afterwards. So someone from the warring tribe, they had to live with you until you healed them. And you had to provide all of their food. <laughs> and you had to make sure their family was looked after. You know, that's that's pretty full on. That's a pretty yeah. powerful disincentive to um, you know, horrendously maim someone, oh I'm gonna stab for the groin because we have to um hold the line. <laughs> hold the line yeah shield it's wall just, it's we'll get back to phalanxes it, right? we'll get back to the <laughs> get back to the greek phalanx and the you know and then you know what the romans did with that they completely you know they just changed a few things they matter it was it was clever i mean in terms of systems it was really good they made sure they were a bit mobile and that they could uh that there was capacity for that to keep to switch around you know uh, <laughs> and they mixed up so they had you know grizzled centurions and veterans throughout and and that there was you know it was easy to just keep changing that front line changing that front line people could slip back you could reform quickly and, and it just fucked the phalanx up because the phalanx was um was unable to be mobile in that way and they had bad uh, uh communication interaction you know all the things that make a system work a complex yeah. system and they also had you know really shitty diversity because they had all of this kind of weapon in one place <laughs> yeah. you know the slingers are over here <laughs> you know the camp followers are over there the the um the the generals and the leaders are over here on this hill and <laughs> you know what i mean it's like no <laughs> no you got to mix it up you got to mix it up and sometimes caesar's got to come down on his horse and bloody get his hands dirty too otherwise um it's all for shit. Yeah. Yeah. So the Romans really sorted that out and made it work for them. So this talk of violence and I guess responsibility, I, I think what I really, one of the things I took away from what you said, but also in some of your conversations with Jim Rutt was this, um, like the responsibility or it's, it's the connection that a violent encounter can kind of provide provide like if, if there are rules that govern a violent mm. encounter the people like 
you're normally better friends with the guy you fight with afterwards anywhere before you went into it. Yeah. And there's a, there's a sort of a, there's a place for it and it needs to be like, if we don't use it, if we don't channel this sort of stuff, it gets, it pops up in places perhaps that we don't really want to, um, that we don't want to see it. You know, it, it, yeah. it, it's, spring, it's expressed in some way. So how do you, yeah. like, I, I can't remember what you, what you mentioned in conversation with Jim, Rupp, but there are like, there, are, I, I guess you kind of just spoke about it with, um, taking care of your, your tribe, your, you know, the warring tribe, you got to take care of the family. Like there's, 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 there's responsibility. There's, um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a mutuality to it. Yeah. And there's a mutuality to it. That's unavoidable. And I mean, when you're in that, it's, 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 it's really annoying because you do have that, you do have that feeling that you, you want to destroy the other, the other person. But, you know, when there's things in place that make sure that, you know, every, every time you're harming that person, you're really only harming yourself as well. <laughs> mm. It forces you once again to inhabit their ontology. And it's very difficult to kill somebody whose ontology you're inhabiting because they're now in your network of relations and therefore they're in your ontology and you have story together. Fuck, I just wanted to knock his teeth out. I can't now. Ah, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's um, that's what violence is supposed to do. That's, that's that particular, you know, awesome technology that we have as humans and that we've had, you know, it's, it's patterned in the way we are. You know, when you find the... Um, you know, when you find the economies removed and the state, the controls of the state is removed temporarily in you know, natural disasters or for any reason, um, you know, you, you find these things emerge. There, there's a bit of a, there's, there's often a bit of um, sort of crappy chaos and, and damage going on where people are struggling to reassert the, the structures. If people are there trying to make sure the hierarchies are in place and to, to keep the game theory side going, but it doesn't, it's not natural. It doesn't last long. So you always end up with people returning to a kind of mutuality um, and, and to these kind of structures for, for violence, for trade, you know, for you know, relations, for, you know, governance, you know, everything it is, you know, these are patterns. We have them in our biology. You know, whales remember, whales and birds remember migration routes. They're born with those. But then we're born with our, um, our rituals of social organization, um, baked in, you know? Yeah. I feel like, at least in my case, I don't know what I'm born with. You know, like, I don't feel like I have the, those rituals, those things as embedded or as, um, as automated, let's say, you know, like I don't have these process. I feel like, um, and perhaps this might be, um, I think it's more universal. This, you know, this idea of, you kind of speak about it when you talk about avatar depression, which I thought was, mm. you know, h hilarious in a bad way, right? You know, watch a mm. t you, you watch a movie uh, about you know, man going to an alien planet, plundering it. There's this beautiful interconnected species, uh, mm. there's a species that you know they've got their. I think about them as like internet tails. They're like completely in integrated with the with the natural environment. It's all wonderful, and then they realize that that's not the case after yeah. watching the movie, and they get depressed. Um, I but I mean that, that's that. that's everyone. I mean, yeah. and you know, my my community were late adopters, um, you know, of, of this system. But you know, really coming into it quite strongly now, we we have a we have a fairly decent sized middle class in the Aboriginal community now. And people who are really on board with the project of civilization, and even the project of colonization and occupation, you know, um, uh, modernization you know, nation building, internationalism, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of us who are into it. There's a lot of people, you know, on the ground, n not even middle class, but, you know, our, a lot of our working classes are, you know, all for extraction. Yeah. All for, you know, we want jobs. We want, um, you know, we want coal mines here so that we've got jobs. Um, you know, all these kinds of things, you know, it's not, um, it's not so easy and clear cut as you know, indigenous people think like this and other people think like this. It's like, um, you know, we're all human beings with exactly the same patterning who've been brought under, you know, the same globalizing uh, sort of network of, you know, economic and governance structures that are mostly illusory and, you know, and designed, you know, with self-terminating algorithms to extract you know maximum value with and you know outsource the entropy and bloody 
uh, pretty much wreck the joint. Um, yeah. You know, for the benefit of a handful of people, it's um, we're all under that and we're all in that. And I know you're fooling yourself if you think you have much of a choice in the matter. It's pretty much your compliance with it is what allows you to, you know, sit and have a Zoom with someone like me. I mean, otherwise you'd be sitting out on the street begging for change, which people don't have anymore because no one uses cash anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, I, mean, I went to um, Woolies the other day and I wanted to get a – Woolies is a grocery store for those of you in, not in Australia. And, you know, you have to have the, the, key, the coin to get the trolley. Yep. I don't have coins on me, so I can't carry. I can't get the trolley, and it was you know, the biggest it. pain in the ass because I'm just Who's got a coin? around all my groceries. You know, coins are dirty. coins are dirty. They're covered in COVID. You don't fuck with coins anymore. Like, yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's terrible. And you know, most Woolies, um, most Woolies has a has a resident homeless person sitting out front. Um, well, a lot of them do now too. <laughs> yeah. the supermarket, and they're not asking for changes. They say, "Can you grab me something when you're inside?" Like, you know, I'm hungry. Can you get me some food while you're in there? I don't care. Give me an apple. <laughs> I'm really hungry. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, they, they, they don't do very well, though. That's why there's usually only one. Yeah. <sighs> so I want to talk about land and going on this international, this global scale type thing, because we've got an, a pretty big population in the, on the planet. Look, looks like it might get to 9 or 10 billion. Um, and... People with more people, we want we we need to distribute more resources so that people are taken care of, right? And something that I think is um, I want to hear your take on on this, but it's about land ownership, like this idea that a a country, like you know, some country can be like, actually, this area on the planet is uh, ours, and mm. no one else can come in here. Like we have sovereignty, we have supreme mm. authority over this given territory. No one can screw with whatever we've got here, and we're going to do what we want with it. And like that does not, I I do not think that is compatible with any sort of thing that we need to be doing to kind of save the world. If we want to say that, you know, like actually yeah. avoid catastrophe. And I'm thinking because in you know we in, in Australia we say this wasn't always will be Aboriginal land, but I don't think it's it's not in this sense of ownership, right? Yeah. It's, it's a custodianship. It's like we are mm. of the land and we tend to it. It's not. It's not an ownership sense. Is is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Not not ownership in the same way. But but ownership doesn't mean something different now. You know, it hasn't been very long um, uh, since this the financial system was developed that demands, you know, like this. I mean, outrageous growth, exponential growth all the time, and it's just that money on money return system. You know, <laughs> that uh, that idea that a person can have money and that money will work for them and just moving that money around and doing different things with it will create more money. Um, in order to do that, there needs to be things. Yeah, I mean, someone has to pay for that. You can extract from the future <laughs> with that one. I mean, it's amazing. Um, you can reach backwards and forwards in time there. But look, that uh, system of financialization, that actually that came out of and that was developed through interactions with indigenous people. It's not something that was brought from the Northern Hemisphere and installed elsewhere. That actually, you know, that came out of our dialogue and um, um, struggles with each other. You know, that, that financial system was, was invented as a Northern Hemisphere response to uh, indigenous peoples in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, yeah, the entire thing. So as I mentioned before, just the idea of land as capital. You know, that, that, that came out of, you know, the need to be able to um, go back on treaties, <laughs> you know, find some legal instrument to undo that and um, trick people out of their land. So the mortgage was invented. The, and the idea of land as capital was invented then too. And then so then the technology rose for surveying and everything was surveyed and broken up. So these are all enclosures now. It's not land anymore. It's real estate, you know, and people are moved around and relocated in that. And... Um, you know, there's a few people who have access to it, but most of the land people don't have access to it. You can't move freely. That's owned either by the crown or, you know, um, by I incredibly rich people. <laughs> and, you know, there are fences, there are dogs, there's trespassing, there's laws. You can't go there. You can only live in certain parts of your city depending on where you are in the caste system. You know, these things are zoned and they're, you know, structurally it's, it's quite brilliant. Um, but, yeah, all of this arose, even the... Um, 
you know, the, uh, the financial system itself, you know, um, you know, all of this, <laughs> all of this came out of like that same, you know, horrendous story. It, it wasn't like that before, you know, when Marx was writing capital, you know, there was, there was a specific way capital was used in tandem with labor, you know, and, um, you know, labor was, was, you know, exerted a, a, a man exerting, you know, their energy upon nature to create, you know, value. And then, you know, um, if you could, you know, have a certain amount of hours worked, then there was, you know, half of that went to that person's subsistence and then half of it was value added. And so there was value creation that went on if at scale that was leveraged to be able to do that, you know, but that's, um, that's not how it works anymore. Um, <laughs> at all. You know, um, basically it, it, the extraction hit a wall, everything hit a wall, like the same way that agriculture hit a wall and um, was pretty much doomed until the green revolution where they invented technologies to, you know, um, to be able to create nitrogen and et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what they're going to do when the phosphorus runs out because there's, there are no more reserves of that left. So <laughs> it's all at the bottom of the sea now, but you know, it, it just, um, it just, it just goes on. It's, it's horrendous. Yeah. It makes me think about, you know, increase versus growth. And I think, you know, we, that really, I really liked that. Um, to growth is, you know, growth is what we think about, like economic growth, I guess, increasing this one number, like just make number go up, you know, graph go up, but at the expense of so much else. And the graph, it's like this, and, you know, it's like upwards, 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 and then it just, it looks like it's just got to completely falter, you know, like yeah. head to zero pretty soon, the termination, death. Yeah. Whereas increase is its growth, but in a different way, right? Well, I, yeah. When you speak about increase, what exactly what exactly are you are you, are you talking about? Um, that fish back there on your didgeridoo, you know that um, that's that's referencing a, an increase center. You know, so there'll be a there'll be a water hole there, or a stretch of river, um, or a lake somewhere, maybe mangroves or estuary. Uh, where fresh is fresh and sold are interacting, but there'll be an increase site there for that um, for that eel tail catfish, and that's where that story you know that's a really powerful story place there, and you keep that story and you keep that place and you look after it, but uh, you also do ceremony for that, and the ceremony is to increase and it's not to increase that fish's numbers because there's homeostasis there. You don't need more of those fish. Um, you know, increase is about increasing the infinite combinatorials in that system, increasing the relationships within that system, you know, and that's what you're singing is that understanding and knowledge of the system and your occupation of your ecological niche as a custodial species. So you sing, you dance that, you do ceremony for that place, you do increase ceremony. And that increase ceremony, that gives you, you know, collectively you have one mind, all people clapping together, dancing together. You have one mind, so you have more computing power. You understand that system and you understand everything that you have to do in the next season, in that place. And you understand it quite, I mean, the amount of information that you need to be able to process just in your brain, it would blow you up. It would crash your, crash your computer. You couldn't do it. So you, you do it through that. And basically everything that you do in your niche as the custodial species there, and particularly as that's your totem and that's that place that you speak for and the story you speak for, you know, you regulate all of the human activity in that place that's going to affect that species. Um, you know, uh, you're also, you know, where to burn and where not to burn, you know, because you have to seasonally in different seasons, you have to burn in different places and it has to be done just right in exactly the right way and you have to understand all of the um, knock-on effects of that mm. so is that something that's just unique to um, dark-skinned people is it just unique to people who whose grandmother was aboriginal or indigenous or something like that you know not that patterning is for all humans so I was talking a couple of days ago to a fellow in Holland so a Dutchman there and he's uh, one of those Frisian Frisian people so he has all that story and knowledge from his great-grandfather 
and he was reading about Aboriginal um, fire management of land and all the complexities of that, you know. And he was like, oh, yes, we have the same thing. We have the same thing over here. <laughs> you know, I have the same story from my grandfather, and he took me through it. I, I talked to him on that podcast, my podcast, The Other Others. Um, I think he's the most recent episode up at the moment. Okay. Um, and that's what what's it called? Uh, kickstarting stalled symbiosis, I think is the, <laughs> the name of that. Um, because he's like, you know, lamenting about all that they're not burning the heather anymore. And the heather is really important, but it's all dying because it's not being burnt. No one's doing the burning land management anymore. So when that happens, it affects everything else. So there's an entire bird species that depends on that burning relationship. Um, the pH of the soil is not doing what it's supposed to do and it's gone acid now. So it's all dying off. Those birds are gone. Uh, they tried to reintroduce that bird species from Sweden. They went and got it and <laughs> reintroduced it, but they all died, <laughs> you know, because that's not how you do it. And he says, no, they don't understand. You have to uh, burn the heather and then the smoke. You know, the smoke is the right smoke. It activates the seed bank and uh, lowers the pH in the soil, and then the, the birds will come. The birds will see the smoke and the birds will come, and they will nest there, and then they will change the pH again with the acid from that one, and then that's in, in, in these these insects come in, and in, in just mapped out the entire system, yeah. mapped out the entire system, and then the uh, agricultural symbiosis then with the the cows as the cattle how they're managed in that landscape, you know, as the megafauna there. Um, you know, re replacing the aurochs, I guess, that they were before, you know, and how that all works together. Absolutely amazing. Um, so, you know, don't tell me that there's some some kind of, I don't know, secret knowledge that or connection that comes with melanin content in your skin. It's like this is a human patterning. Everyone's got it. And the law is there. And he's telling, and, and he, so this comes back to story, and this answers your question. I know it sounds like I got away from it, but please. <laughs> this comes back to... Um, this comes back to story. All of the, you know, folklore and children's tales and uh, mythologies, you know, that might get, you might only see through Harry Potter or whatever that's come from there. This is all story and it's important. And so I said to him, well, tell me, so what's story for Salamander? Because I've heard that Salamander story, like, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of myth that they can't be burned by fire, etc. You know, does that come into your fire management? And he goes, ah, oh, yes, well, you know, yes, they can be burned. Of course, that's that's a myth. But uh, no, that's a story. And that, that's a seasonal story, you know. That's a that's a seasonal story about when to burn. And so he goes through, you know, the seasons. And, and there's not four. Four seasons is an economic cycle. It's not a natural cycle. He's got more seasons than that there. So it goes through the seasonal information of when you know that you have to burn. And you've got to burn at exactly the right time. Um, at the end point, you've got it to the day. You have to know when the end point of the salamander's hibernation beneath the ground is finished because your burning of that landscape is a signal to the salamanders to come up out of the ground from their hibernation. And so that story is about them crawling across the ash afterwards. That's where that story comes from. You've got story. Yep. You've got story there, everybody, and it's still in place. You know, and he was talking about the salamander population is becoming extinct. It's becoming in danger because nobody's burning the country. So they don't receive that signal, that seasonal signal to come up. And so only half of them come up and the others die down there. You know, and so there's not as many salamanders every season. They lose half the, half the population. And you know how that works. Mm. Mm. And this but I guess there's always one. If you keep halving... <laughs> Then you get into Z is it Zeno's paradox? Yeah. Is that what it's yeah. called? Yeah. 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 Yeah, the arrow in flight or the tortoise in the hare. Yeah, yeah. And you so the, Yep. That idea yeah. that frog jumps across the pond halfway, but then every jump over that after that is half the distance yeah. to get to the other side. So therefore he never reaches it. Never gets there. He just ends up at the edge of the pond like doing little nano hops into <laughs> infinity. <laughs> My son eats like that. You give him something really? to eat. And he'll eat <laughs> half of it in one bite and turn it around, eat the other half in the other bite until he's finally got this tiny little shred between his little fingers. And he just mm, and still keeps Apparently. going like that until he's got nothing. It seems to have nothing there, but there must be a speck because he keeps nibbling at it. The little bastard, he does, he knows paradox with how he eats. 
I reckon that's the same for a lot of people. Like if I get a pizza or if, you know, you've got maybe a couple beers in the fridge or something, you're like, oh, we've got lots. We'll have a couple. And then you're like, oh, yeah. you know, as the supply goes down, there's less and less and less. And then yeah. you're on your last, your last piece, your last, last slice. Like, yeah. oh, I'm make this one. It's going to make this one special. It's, it's funny, though. It's, there's something magic that happens, and this gets us back to the philosopher's stone. In a sharing economy, it's sharing economy, sharing, demand sharing is part of a, a relational economy, a system of relational credits. It's not barter, it's relational credits. If you give somebody something, you're establishing a relationship with them and you have a mutuality then. So that person will be, you know, bringing you something back. Might be in the future, might be right away, you know, of, of similar value. You have like an economy of, you know, relational credits in that way. Things are different. Yeah, th things change. There is so if you have, there's not much food there and you're all sharing it, there's a weird loaves and fishes thing that happens, mm. you know, because it's a, the relational economy is, is one of abundance and it's weird. Like, I, so I fed 20 people. There's one Christmas back home. Well, what did we have? A tiny little tin of prawns from the river. We had one of those eel tail catfish you got there. We had a magpie goose and half a bag of rice. And we fed 20 people and we were all full at the end of it. And we didn't know how that happened. But there's a loaves and fishes thing that happens. There's something, there's a philosopher's stone there. And it's yeah. something to do with, um, you see it, you read that Jeffrey West. Yeah, scale. You know, scale. Yeah. yeah. And, and you look at the power law, the, the power laws of, of, of scale in nature and how you get that, um, you know, buy four, get one free kind of. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I think of it anyway. He doesn't call it like that. He's like, it's a 20%, 20%, 25% gain every time the system doubles. You know, so the size of an animal in terms of its metabol how much food it needs, metabolism, yeah, etc. It it's only needs seventy five percent more if it doubles. Yeah. Mass, so you yeah. scale right up, then there's a ceiling because you get to the blue whale and that's maxed out then. He's incredibly yeah. efficient, just eats a handful of plankton from time to time, he's good. Yeah. But you can't scale beyond that in the same way that a corporation can't scale past half a trillion dollars. You know. Um so the same sort of laws Scaling laws apply to, um, you know, financial systems, economic systems, you know, civilization systems, you know, infrastructure, everything else. However, there's a different power law there at work because it's not as efficient in these tinkered systems that we have. You're not um, leveraging that, um, that biological power law because there's less. So where in nature you buy four, get one free in, um, you know, um, contemporary, you know, modern systems like you know synthetic systems you buy five get one free kind of thing you know it's um there's it's it's less efficient so you know in an indigenous economy an indigenous economy is part of the landscape it's not just biomimicry it's not just copying the landscape that that increased site for that fish on your didgeridoo there that is a that is a place and it's part of the economy it's important and it's abundance economy and it's a relational economy and um yeah. and that does scale and it scales well and there's really like amazing power laws in there that have not been able to be replicated by these contemporary systems um, of civilization and i guess therein lies the magic that is sought that philosopher's stone that um that little hidden missing oh, that one little bit of substance where we can turn lead into gold that little alchemical bit of magic maybe we'll find it in these paleolithic ancient wisdom maybe we'll find it there and then we'll realize the transhumanist utopia where we're after enlightenment 2.0 um yeah. don't don't mention the war yeah i mean enlightenment as the days go on seems like watching the sunset on a veranda with the trees rustling and you know kids laughing in the background i don't think it's uploading your brain to the internet and being a you know an ai lord like i don't th I think there's been a pushback away from transhumanism i reckon like this i we integrate with technology because the technology is kind of already here mm. we just have kind of forgotten about it yeah pushback it's more of a recoil at the level of users mm. but the, the people who are making it there's the, there's no pushback there <laughs> The, the, and it's not just people. I mean, they're, they're devotees, but it's system. It's a system thing. It's a self-organizing system. It's um, it's structural now. That's that's baked in. That's um, yeah. 
that's inevitably the thing that's going to drive the people who are operating in that. Yeah. I want to like this talk about increase in the system uh, makes me think of, and just Jeffrey the mention of Jeffrey West. And when I think about Jeffrey West, I think about energy, like a big part of its energy for me. And I used to, there's this measurement, I think called uh, energy rate density, right? It sounds like mm. a fancy term, but it's like how much energy is flowing through a system per unit time per unit mass. So like, you know, how many joules per second per kilo. And uh, this guy called Eric Chasen uh, is, is an astrophysicist has written about this and it's you know, really interesting. It's like, oh, well, as energy rate density goes up, things are more complex, like the more um, advanced or, you know, um, like a star has quite a low energy rate density and then Earth, uh, then, you know, um, like simple life forms have a, real, have a higher energy rate density. And as you go up in terms of complexity, so does energy rate density. Mm -hmm. And our societies have super huge energy rate densities. And I was thinking like, well, that's wrong. That's, it, it can be sort of thought of as a degree, of, yep. as a measurement of progress. However, if we think about, I think like after reading your book, I've been thinking about energy rate density to measure like what's the ener energy rate density of Earth, right? So mm. the entire planet, like Gaia, this living system, that should be the one that we're trying to you know, turn up because it increase, right? Increase. I in think. I think that, yeah. I think the key there is living system. Mm. You know, there is no better ROI than what you get from a living system. Now, the systems that we're living in, the complex systems that we're living in of, of civilization, these are indeed complex and they are indeed, um, I, I would even say that they've achieved a kind of sentience, you know, a kind of singularity. They're, they're that complex. But that's it's not a living system. There is a living system lower in the stack that it rests on. That's a living system. And that is something that is um, not interacting well with it. It's certainly not driving the patterns of it. And that's why you're not getting the same ROI there. You know, you have as much complexity and you even have, you certainly have infinitely more complication there in these tinkered systems, but they're not living systems. A living system and a living culture that is of that living system, that's where you get your your really good energy return on any energy investment. Mm. And that's where the Philosopher's Stone is. Unfortunately, the Philosopher's Stone requires a, a complete, uh, not just a, a, a change to the structure or inclusion of a few externalities in our accounting systems or anything like that. It requires a completely different system. And yeah. that seldom occurs without bloodshed. Mm. Um, so it's a, it is a tricky step to make. It's, um, you know, we're on the precipice of that and yeah. there are no safety nets and it's a it's a very going to be a very difficult transition to make yeah the next two decades are going to be wild are going to be oh my wild. goodness yeah and it's you know 2020 came along and it's like january boom covid i hope you're ready welcome to a new decade whatever happened last decade is long gone you're in yep. for the real ride now like that's it buckle up well and there's we that stack there's that stack like i said you know nature that which is still what we call nature now there is a living system, you know, at the bottom of that stack and it will smack. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's not liking all this weight on it of all the other, the layers of this stack that's on top, uh, all these layers of abstraction, yeah. you know, these illusions. Jim Ratt said, um, nature yeah, bats last. Yeah. Nature bats <laughs> yeah. last. And yeah. you know, it's, um, yeah, it will reassert itself and you can move with that and, you know, regain. I mean, it's the good thing about disasters is that you do have the capacity, as long as the structure itself is disrupted enough, you do have the capacity within a few weeks to regain your your biological patterning as a human being and to rediscover your your place in community and in in a landscape. It makes me think of um the the Amazonians. So the Amazon. <laughs> is actually a massive garden. It's oh, yeah. Not a rainforest. Sorry, I thought you meant like the mythology from ancient oh, yeah. Greece. No, no, sorry. Because <laughs> yeah. that's, that's pertinent too. But yeah. anyway, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, something's triggering like the Amazon here. It's like, it's not about like, yeah, sure, things collapse. Well, it actually wasn't too connected, but I had the Amazon just stuck in my head. Um, mm. Like this idea of custodial species, like um, 
the Amazon is actually a massive garden that was kind of tended to by the, mm. the population there, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. They think like it's all random trees, but yeah. when, I think when they analyze it, it's actually just a massive, massive, massive garden. And that's mm. kind of what we're, that, that really fits with this, um, this notion. Like, I love this idea of the custodial species because that's what we need to be, right? That, that's, the, that's who we are. Um, and we are the gardeners of this planet. That's, that's kind mm. of how it, it seems. And I guess what, the one thing that I wanted to ask you was like, okay, we're in this shit show, like we're in the middle of it. We have some ideas about what this might look like. Mm. Um, in, a world, in a world where we have global connectivity and we have, you know, we are connected digitally throughout the world. Um, and there's this notion that countries, like I'm feeling countries are on their last legs. Do you think that the future will be a reduction to bioregions that are connect? Like, imagine if like this the country syndicated. is actually bioregions syndicated. Yeah, syndicated. Yeah, what, what do that, you mean that's, by that? Well, that's how it scales. So you, as an individual, nobody can boss you. Nobody's your boss. But at the same time, you're you know you're syndicated with other people in your network. And you're limited by your obligations to maintain those relationships. And then all the people in that sort of local network, same thing. Nobody can boss that clan, but they're syndicated with other clans. And then no one can boss that village or the people living in that bioregion. But that's syndicated, mm. you know, um, through trade, but also embassy with, with the other regions around it. You, do you see what I mean? Do you, do you think that's the way it like scales. Bio regions, though. It'll be like bio regions will be the, the natural borders that exist. Well, they always are. Like I said, that, that, that's never been eradicated, even in the UK. On that tiny obliterated island, the land is still giving them all of their regional accents. And that, that won't go away. Yeah, okay. <laughs> They'll go back to that. So it's like you a know. remembering. It's like getting rid of the, it's like pulling yeah, off well, the wall paint, the, 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 the wallpaper. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, a, a pig that's, you know, multi-generational raised in a feedlot can hardly stand, you know. Yeah. It doesn't take them long if you dump them out in the bush. It doesn't take them long to, um, you know, they grow back those big black bristles and tusks pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and they become crazy. just masters of their domain very yeah. fast. You know, wild, wild pigs are incredible and they're, they're very good meat too but i mean if we if we take your amazon example you, you know how every now and then you get a you know a, a tribe uncontacted previously by humans <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unknown to man you know this tribe has come out of the amazon and sort of they've given up and decided to join civilization they're like oh fuck. we're sick of living off grid it doesn't work we're coming in you know it's kind of how it's that's portrayed in the media <laughs> But they're people who you describe that big garden, but that's a, a whole heap of different systems managed by different people. Mm. You know what I mean? Managed very carefully. But they also, you can't, and no system can live on its own. It's part of a bigger system and it must interact with all the other systems in within that system, if you know what I mean. And so trade happens like that. Um, but they're also, um, you know, one system's entropy is another system's lunch. So there are these, you know, closed loops you know, between those systems as well, there's recycling going on. There's, I mean, that system is part of the Sahara, for example. Without the dust storms in the Sahara, the Amazon couldn't exist. That's where it gets all of its nutrients. <laughs> That's from dust yeah. storms in the Sahara. You cover 25%, 20% of the Sahara with bloody um, solar panels, like some people have suggested. You change the microclimate there. You increase rainfall. You know, and oh, that's a good thing, right? Not no more dust storms. The Amazon dies. These are these systems are all interrelated. So when you have that tribe coming in out of the wild, never contacted by civilization before, it's not because they've given up on their harsh survival, bloody Hobbesian nightmare existence. It's because their existence is no longer feasible. So you, Sam, you are over there in your in your eel tail cat, catfish place. But you, you're taken away from that, or that place is destroyed, and you're no longer taking care of the increase center there for that one. You know, therefore, those catfish aren't traveling up the river anymore to that next mob down there. You know, um, and so those ones who've never been contacted by civilization, suddenly there's no bloody fish in the river, or there's not enough fish to survive. Suddenly, you know, um, this tree is not flowering anymore, and then these ants have disappeared and then the system's falling apart 
and it can no longer support life. It looks like a beautiful, untouched wilderness jungle, but um, it can no longer support life. It's a desert now, a green desert, and so in they have to come. You know, it um, it that kind of syndicated diversity, that I don't know, um, federated municipality, whatever you want to call it. You know that um, that system that does scale the way systems scale when they're all interdependent and behaving like a system mm. um systems within systems wheels within wheels they all need to be turning and, and generating that way you uh block them off you fence that off and you go well that's a national park over there well it's it's death national parks are just dead mm. Because they're closed, right? It's because yeah, no they're not interacting with any other yeah. systems, so they will die. And they're just, you know, it's a tree that's been cut halfway through and it just hasn't fallen yet. Hmm. And it's a loss of knowledge. Like, that's like the, the death of systems is a loss of knowledge in the truest sense, right? It's not like knowledge in a book it's like it's it's embodied knowledge and like that to me that's what knowledge like if no if if you've got a bible and there's no one around to read it it's just like complex stuff on a page right? yeah it's not interpretable it actually needs to be lived and the destruction of these systems like what i what i thought was amazing was you know i was reading your um i can't remember what it was called but it was in the griffith review or griffith something and the patterns of life grant you with predictive powers right like you say okay when this happens or if, if, the, if the whales aren't here now, that means X, Y, Z. Like it's a yeah, it's a forecasting tool to put it in terrible terms. Yeah. you know, and like it yeah. is, but it's 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 more yeah. than it's, just um, um, observing the world. It's like yeah, it's pr prediction in a way. It's agent-based modeling, but you know, in real time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no models. It's real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I reckon we'll, um, we'll, we'll wrap up in just a couple of minutes. I guess what are you what are you up to at the moment? What are you um, what are you working on? Where can people kind of catch up and keep up to date with what you with what you've got going on? Because I know, I mean, I want to be like absorbing more of it because I just feel like I'm getting um, it's like a plug of I, I don't know how it, I don't want to I, I tend to use technological. Um, metaphors like it's i've mm. got a new software upgrade or something silly but it's not like that it's kind of like um yeah it's like vines on a building or something mm. that mm. bring in something extra you know bring in some vitality yeah so well that's yeah. i mean so i'm we're currently setting up the, this uh indigenous knowledge systems lab and all of the relationships that are needed to sustain that and that's that's taking up a lot of my time um yeah, because it's if it's if you're just one person um, doing this stuff, you know, with your own fabulous network of relations, then I mean that's that's not much at all. You need to be, you know, that 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 does need to that does need to scale. Uh, so setting up this lab of a lot of um, you know similar thinking people, so indigenous, you know, complexitorians, if you like, who uh, you know coming together to uh, you know kind of think tank. And they're bringing all their networks of relations. And so we're hoping to seed, you know, a lot of these sort of, you know, we're hoping copycat will kick in and, and there'll be lots of, you know, because there's lots of indigenous knowledge labs that talk about, that are basically about recording, capturing indigenous knowledge, you know, like the content and sharing it, you know, here's how you make a fire without a, without, without it matches. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, and, you know, oh, here's this ecological knowledge. You know, it's just declarative knowledge, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, you know, we're not doing any of that. It's just systems, patterns, processes, you know, that are uh, generalizable and that, that are applicable to, you know, the, the um, sort of meta-crisis, really, to resolving some of the, you know, intractable uh, complex problems around the world, you know, and providing analysis of that. Uh, in real time as much as possible, but then also lots of research, which is slower. But we, we try to we try to do things in real time and we try to make sure there's lots of yarns with as many different kinds of people from around the world as possible. And so we bang up four or five of those a month on the uh, podcast there, the other yeah. others <clears throat> out of Anchor FM, so, just a really so, simple, raw so yarn sort of like podcast. podcast. And that, that's pretty much yarns, all we're right? doing. Like it's, a, it's like a new medium for yarns. 
That's it. Okay. Well, it's the it's the new, it's the new campfire, you know. But long form, long form, long form podcast with yeah. just natural conversations going on. Not the uh, not the heavily long produced long. twenty yeah, minute, yeah. highly you know, lots of awesome audio and all that sort of thing. It's not that. There's you know, yeah. people get up and they go out and take a piss and then they come back yeah. and you know, it's part of the podcast. You know, yeah. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> um, is that the water yeah. So in the background or is that? Oh no, that's just the toilet running. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just uh, that's just what it is. You know, it's it's the actual ontology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, so doing that, and um, I don't know, um, I, I prefer it if people stop trying to, con I mean, I, I, I do like talking to people with more relationships than I can manage, I'm good, like, oh, it's too much, man, and, and stop buying the book, sure. if, if you want me to write another book, like, just leave me alone for a bit, I'm, I haven't had time to write anything, I would, I'd like to have time to write it, but I'm basically just constantly trying to keep up with these communications all the time, because yeah. I don't want to be rude. Uh, but there's no way I can maintain that many relationships. My, my wife and I have started using Dunbar as a verb. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the idea of the Dunbar number, you can only maintain like you know, a couple of hundred yeah. relations, 150 or, like or that, so yeah. relations, 150 on average. You know, um, you know, and so Dunbar is sort of a, a noun or an adjective, but we've been using it as a verb um, for culling relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Coming on, <laughs> but she said the other day. She said, um, "I know some guy said something horrendous on Facebook, who's in her network." And she goes, oh, "I'm going to, I'm going to dumb by the shit out of that guy." <laughs> yeah. So we're we're constantly trying to prune our networks down to a manageable size, and it's um it's it's impossible at the moment. Yeah, um, and I reckon. It's yeah. A good idea so so it's don't look me up. Don't find yeah. me. Don't contact me. Don't buy my book. Um, uh, if you've got an Audible subscription, you can get it for free on Audible. So just get it for free, and like, and then just I don't know, talk amongst yourselves for a minute. Just give me a minute. Um, give us a minute. I I, 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 I well, want to write a sequel. I appreciate you giving me lots of minutes. Um, that's uh, you know, lots of gratitude there. No worries, no worries. It's just yeah. one blue square on the calendar to the next, bros. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> it's one way to live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, calendars are oppressive. They are. They are. Here I am talking up all this stuff that I don't actually know anymore. Like, I mean, I, I know it enough to be able to say the words out of my mouth. It's not like yeah. I'm living it. Mm. You know, there's black cockatoos flying around right now in the season. I haven't seen them. I'm inside doing these fucking things. Yeah. Horrendous. Horrendous. I don't actually know any of the things I'm talking about anymore because I'm not living them, you know. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, Tyson, thank you very much. No worries, bud. <laughs> Catch you later.